Good morning. Welcome to our weekly Bible study. I am so excited. We are starting a brand new letter written by Peter. But before we get into, I'm impressed to have a word of prayer for our nation. We as a nation in the midst of turmoil, tensions, confusion, unrest, in the midst of all those, I feel like we need to call on our almighty God for his amazing intervention. So would you please join with me before we start our study in a word of prayer. Eternal God, our Father, we thank you for your amazing love and grace through Jesus Christ. In the midst of turmoil, confusion, tension, and fear, we need your peace, comfort, strength, and your help. We pray that our nation would be able to emerge from its darkness to seek God and be a light to others. We pray that all of us, our family, and our nation would follow God and be blessed. We pray for all in authority and all of our leaders in government so that we can live peaceful and quiet lives marked by dignity and godliness. We pray that you would give wisdom, knowledge to our president, vice president, senators, congressmen, governors, county supervisors, mayors, and all those in position of authority. We pray that our hearts and our nation would pursue righteousness or rather than sin. We pray that our words and actions would be loving toward others and line up with the God's word. We pray that we would be a nation who lives up to its name of United States of America and be united in love, mind, and thought. Deliver us from all evil things. O oh, Father, cause us to sense nearness of your very presence in the midst of our chaos. This I pray in the most powerful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's continue to hold our nation in prayer. Now, as I watched last night's uh, riots and fires and all those things going on in the midst of a major cities in the United States, I didn't realize the parallel when Peter wrote this letter to the churches in the Asia Minor. There are similar things that happened, and I, I'm not drawing a comparison. However, the tension that was built up during that time, as well as where we are sensing right now, it has a lot of things in common. So I feel like it's an appropriate study for us to look in the Word of God for hope and comfort. So with that, I want to dedicate this letter of First Peter for our study. So I like to read the first two verses. Today it will be an introduction to this particular letter. So please open your Bible and starts with the verse 1. 
1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect, exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood. Grace <coughs> and peace be yours in abundance. Now, fascinating two verses. From the very outset, Peter jumps in with a major theological discussion about election and choice. So these two verses, I believe at least it takes two weeks for us to complete it. So be patient with me as we introduce this particular letter. As you noticed, the first word, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, is the author of this particular letter, Peter. Let me give you the backdrop of this letter. On July 1964 AD, this day was a devastating day in the history of Rome. That day, Nero, the emperor, set the city of Rome on fire. Rome was a city of narrow streets. It was a dense city of population. On both sides of the street, there were wooden high apartments where people lived. At once the fire hit Rome, it consumed the entire place. The Roman people believed that their emperor, Nero, who was the maniac who set the city on fire. They also believed because he had an amazing lust for building bright new buildings. His great challenge of life was to build new structures. In order to build, he had to destroy the old ones. People were totally devastated. The culture of that city went down. The temple of Jupiter, the temple of Luna, the shrine of Vesta, the altar, and all the religious elements of their life were completely destroyed. The very household of gods were burned up. It was not just an economic loss, but the entire social, cultural losses as well. But it was some kind of a religious chaos and confusion, and people were homeless. They had not only lost their homes, but they had lost one another in death. Their resentment was bitter, and it was deep. Nero realized 
he had to redirect their hostility. He decided to blame Christians are the one who started the fire. Those days, Christians were hated. So he knew Christians would not support the emperor worship. Christians were always talking about a, a future day when the whole world will dissolve in flames. And it was so fitting to blame Christians for the fire. As a result of this accusation, under Nero, persecution against Christians began. <coughs> Nero used Christians while they were alive as living torches for his garden parties. So pressure and persecution was applied to the Christians, and they scattered all over the place. Now, according to uh, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 13, we have the location where Peter wrote this letter. Verse 13. So he who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends <coughs> you her greetings, and so does my son Mark. So here, Babylon, ident Babylon is identified by Peter where he's writing this letter approximately in 64 AD. <coughs> Babylon has a different views on this location as far as the name Babylon was concerned. Some argue the ancient Babylon in Mesopotamia. Others say the Babylon on the River Nile in Egypt. But then some say Babylon is a nickname or a pseudo name or a code word for Rome. And I tend to lean toward that argument. <coughs> it was a Rome where Paul, excuse me, Peter wrote this uh, letter. Rome was the pseudo name for Babylon. And if you can look at this and see Revelation 17 and 18, this name will be appeared as Babylon. So around 64 AD, he is writing from Rome to the Christians and to the believers as a word of encouragement and comfort, giving such a hope for Christians in those times. So let's go back to verse 1. First Peter chapter 1, verse 1. <coughs> Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Peter was the most recognized leader among the 12 men who were chosen by Jesus Christ. His name heads up all four references in the New Testament among the apostles. And you can see them in Matthew chapter 10, verses 2 through 4, and the Gospel of Mark chapter 3, verses 16 through 19, and Luke chapter 6, verse 13 through 16, <coughs> of course, book of Acts chapter 1, verse 13. Peter and his brother, Andrew, had a fishing business on the Sea of Galilee. They were originally from the town called Bethsaida, and later they moved to a city, town called Capernaum. 
Peter was a married man. According to 1 Corinthians 9, the chapter, his wife traveled with him during the missionary journey. He also had another name. That was his secular name, Simon. Peter, Peter was one of those inner circle of Jesus Christ, along with James and John. He was with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. Peter denied Jesus three times. Three days later, Jesus comes and asking Peter, do you love me? He asked three times, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? To restore the threefold denial of Peter. Fifty days later, we see this Peter who was filled with the Holy Spirit and he is speaking the God, resurrected Lord Jesus Christ message. And that day, 3,000 people got saved and were added to the church. Apostle Peter's name was mentioned in the New Testament 210 times. And Apostle Paul's name mentioned 162 times. Apostle Paul, known as the Apostle of Faith. Apostle Peter, known as the Apostle of Hope. And Apostle John, known as the Apostle of Love, which we discussed this last several weeks. Peter had to watch while they crucified his wife. And then we know the end of Peter. He said, please crucify him upside down. So that's the author we have in the very first verse is identified. Look at the next sentence. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect, exiles, scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. Now, when you look at that portion of this scripture, Peter identifies his readers as God's elect or God's chosen. He identifies them in two ways. First, he identifies them in relation to their place here on the earth. Secondly, he identifies them <clears throat> in relation to their place in heaven. Let me show you what I mean by that. As far as the earth goes, they are scattered throughout, and the scripture says, they scattered, they are in exiles, scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. These are the provinces in our modern day country called Turkey. As far as heaven goes, they are chosen 
according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, by the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit, who obeyed Jesus Christ, having been sprinkled with his blood, began to affect the Christians who were there, whom Peter calls aliens and strangers. So in earthly realm, these Christians were scattered into Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bethany are the locations where our churches. So he is referring to these believers, these Christians who are scattered. They are strangers. They are in exile, just like Israelites were in exile in Babylon. He is making reference to, you are a stranger, you are in exile in these earthly provinces, such as Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. And they were foreigners in a hostile culture. Christians are aliens and strangers. We're foreigners in a, in a foreigners and strangers in this earth. We don't belong here. So church is a group of people who are strangers scattered throughout the world, away from their heavenly home. And Peter is saying, we are scattered or dispersed throughout the Roman provinces. And because of the Christian persecution, Peter is warning them to know they are chosen by God. Deuteronomy 7 verse 6, God told Israelites, for you are a chosen people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen to be people for his own possession. Out of all the people are on the face of the earth. God chose Israel. God chose Abraham. God chose Isaac. He chose Jacob, Moses, Joshua, David, Daniel. God chose 12 men as his own disciples for Christ. God chose you and God chose me. The church of Jesus Christ is chosen by God. We are his possession. They are holy nation. Now, the selection and the election of God for his own people. This can be best illustrated the parable Jesus said about a, a landowner of a vineyard went to the marketplace to hire six o'clock in the morning. And the work days in those time was 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., 12 hours. So he hired some people who were there and said, I need workers. So he hired them for a day's wage, denarius. <coughs> then after three hours later, nine o'clock, he went out to the market again. He needed more workers. He saw some people. So he hired them and agreed the wages, and they came to work. Then at 12 o'clock, he went to hire some more. And three o'clock, and then five o'clock to 6 p.m. So at the end of the day, when he rewarded them, all of them got the same amount. 
And that is the amazing grace of choice of God. Regardless of what time, <coughs> how long, is not the issue. All of them were promised the reward of eternal life. That's the moral of that particular story. Regardless how many hours they have labored. All of them got the same reward. The landowner chose everybody and got the same reward for their salvation. Now, I want you to recognize Paul just getting into this great theology <coughs> of God's elect, exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bethany. Then he has said, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood. We're going to look each of those sentences, what it means, what it meant when Peter made this remark. But let me conclude with the one reference and then we'll pick up the rest of them. What does it mean? We have been sprinkled with his blood. You gotta come back next week to see what Peter is saying. <coughs> so let me look at one portion of scripture in the book of Exodus, chapter 19. Exodus 19. Verse 5. Listen to these words. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be a treasured possession. All through the whole earth is mine. You will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to Israelites. Now, Paul, Peter takes these words of Moses to the nation of Israel. Now, he interprets that same words to the church in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse number 9. Listen to these words. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful lights once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but, you but now you have received mercy. I want you to look. Verse number two in 1 Peter chapter one, it starts off with this. Who have been chosen? He is referring to the people who've been scattered to the different provinces of Turkey. And he is telling them, you are chosen. You are a peculiar person. I want you to see God's amazing grace and mercy has been bestowed upon his people. We were once upon a time in the darkness. Now God has called us out of the darkness into the marvelous light and we are his people. We are the chosen generation. We are the royal priesthood. We are a holy nation. God has an amazing plan and purpose for you. 
What are they? You got to come back next week to find out the whole truth, nothing but the whole truth from the word of God. May God bless you richly. Thank you.